Hello again, everyone, and something completely different for you today, so completely out of character, but uh, I'm very excited about it. Today is Monday, July 27th. I was going to run this video on Thursday, three days from now, but I just finished the interview with the person, and I'm just so excited I want to get it out there for tomorrow. So I'm going to make it very plain and simple. The interview is very long. Um, I'm calling it a segment, which actually turned into a whole show, in this case, Interview with a Champion. Um, I am so delighted, proud to be able to have had this guy on my podcast. I don't even know what that is. But I, I interviewed him on Zoom. I put up a Zoom thing. He came on, and and um, and I had the privilege of buying his number one trophy championship card uh, and cards in 2011. So the name is David Cohen. Because the video is so long, I'm just going to rapidly run through the 2011 World Cards right now, uh, just to show you them. So let me let me show you these while I'm kind of sitting here, and hopefully you can see these. So a couple of cards from the. Um, from the nine card set. These are the kind of the upcoming profile of the New Worlds next year stuff. They have two of those typically in every nine card set. This is the English card from English stamp card that the participants got in the nine card set from 2011. Here is the staff card. Again, stamp staff card. Top 32. Top 16. Quarter finalist. Semi finalist. Finalist. Back then, they still hadn't had come out with the champion cards yet, so finalist was the top as far as the stamped. And then you've got the number three trophy from that year. You can see it here, hopefully. Number two. And David Cohen's number one trophy card from 2011. So, again, my intention, and this interview was so wonderful because my intention is to bring back some of the history of the, of the game as well. And of course, most of us that are watching are collectors. I'm not a, a you know, I didn't play the game, uh, although I was actually studying to play the game at one point, thinking I could do it. And uh, very challenging, um, but just overwhelming to me when you start to understand all the myriad of different strategies people could use. But this young man was one of the most incredible young men I've ever watched play the game, just the maturity and the skill that he had. And in showing the interview today, which is about 34 minutes, so it's long, but I hope you'll watch it. I hope you'll watch it to understand the history. He is so articulate and he is so great at describing kind of back then what was going on. Um, so hopefully, whereas you might not watch me for 30 some minutes, you will watch him. Uh, you'll get your family to watch him, your kids to watch him, because it's really a commentary on the, the Pokemon community as a whole. It's not just the card collecting, it's the game playing, the video game, Pokemon Go, the plush. It's everything that makes us a community. Uh, but it's really what he um, uh, attributes his success in life is really the beginning coming from all of the, the, um, the strengths that he pulled from being involved in the Pokemon game and the community as a whole. So with that, I'm going to finish up right now. Um, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, please like, comment, and subscribe. I plan to do more of these with other champions as I'm able to uh, find them and they agree to speak with me. But let me know if you like this. I, I just uh, I know I'm over the top because of course I'm proud to own his card and I'm proud to have been there when he was winning. But but hopefully you guys will enjoy the history of this interview. So enjoy. Me today uh, in my first segment of interview with a champion, uh, David Cohen, who um, who I remember distinctly from 2011. Uh, not to mention many other tournaments where I watched you as well. But when I was very fortunate enough to watch you win the the number one uh, champion of the Masters division at that point, right? I guess you were 16? That's correct. Yep. At that point, I was, for a brief year, I was the youngest uh, Masters division world champion. Um, and then Igor Costa, the next year when he won, he was like a couple months younger than me uh, at the time that I won. <laughs> wow. So very cool. Um, so yeah, so tell people, you know, I mean, I, I was fortunate to acquire your number one trophy card, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But but tell people um, about your background, you know, to, uh, in the game, you know, specifically. So some of the, some of the awards you won, some of the championships you participated in, that kind of thing. Totally. So I started playing uh, around the the Dragon Frontiers expansion era, which would have been like 2006. Um, so uh, in the senior division, I, I played there for about three years. 
um, won uh, a, a couple top placings at um, some regionals and states and things like that. But 2009 was my first kind of big success. That was uh, my first world championships. Um, and I had actually, uh, me and my buddy created, uh, we kind of we copied a deck the night before the tournament that we had seen some people playing. And we, we saw them, them testing it. We were like, wow, this looks really cool. We don't have anything better to play. So we, we kind of uh, copied what we saw, threw a couple things in because we didn't really know their exact strategy um, and just rolled with it. And uh, that uh, netted me a, a second place uh, world championships victory. So I lost in, in the top two um, to a very uh, talented Japanese player playing uh, an amazing deck that just crushed me. So that was kind of my, my first taste of uh, uh, victory. But, you know, I, I wanted more than that. So I've actually got my two, um, the checks, the big cardboard cutout checks that they give out. So I've got the second place there and then the first place uh, above it. So, yeah, two years later, um, uh, made it back. 2000, in 2009, you finished second. Mm -hmm. you, were still in, you were still in Masters at that point. You were 14-ish. Correct. Yeah, still in seniors. Uh, I mean, seniors. Then, I'm sorry. I'm saying the wrong division. Yes, correct. No, seniors, kidding. of course. And then, um, and then two years later, still in seniors, and that's when you won the the championship. Yeah. So, so that the 2009 second place was actually my last year in seniors. So then I aged up to the masters division. Okay. Uh, you're, 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 what you're telling me is you're showing the world how little I know about this <laughs> stuff. It's just like I say, not being a game player, I'm always there watching, but I don't sometimes get the exact age brackets right. So. So thank no, you for correcting so <laughs> me. Um, and let me say one more thing because I feel so bad uh, as I let you continue. Um, I talked to you right before we came on. We chatted for just a couple minutes. But then having said to you, thank you so much for taking the time and chatting with us all and me especially and how privileged I was to have you on. I never said that on the broadcast. <laughs> so I want to make sure I tell you that it is a privilege to be on with you. I've had so much respect for you through the years and, uh, and it's just... I'm, I'm like in awe. So, okay, now continue. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you. That means a lot to me. I'm, I'm really ecstatic to be on here and, and yeah, happy to do any of these kinds of interview things. I think any kind of, any broadcasting of the Pokemon scene and especially kind of the, the history, uh, I think is super important because I consider myself a historical figure that maybe the modern day new player might not uh, know very well. So, you know, getting my name out there again, uh, that's always cool. Um, so yeah, I, I played uh, the next year, 2010 was my first year in Masters. And when you place in the top four, I believe you get an automatic invite to the next World Championship. So it kind of inherently makes you not try as hard throughout the whole year because you already are, are certain to be going back to that, that World Championship tournament. So uh, didn't do great that first year in Masters, but then uh, 2011 having to earn my invite again really sparked that kind of uh, drive in me again. Um, so I was, I was playing hard throughout the year and then, yeah, coming, coming into that 2011 world championships, um, uh, for some little card game history, basically, that was, uh, uh, a weird year in the sense that they ended up having to do a, a mid-year card rotation. So certain cards left the format, uh, due to an imbalance of, of power between some cards. Um, so the card pool that was eligible to be played with was very small, uh, and it, it, resulted in only three or so really big decks um, that existed. And so there was a lot less to kind of test against because you were almost certain that players would be playing kind of one of these two or three decks, um, which made kind of uh, deciding on a deck easier in some senses. Um, and I think that was my main advantage that year is I really didn't want to play one of those decks. And so I spent a lot of time uh, really developing um, a fringe deck, which was the, the Magnezone Embor deck. People, that had actually won the U.S. National Championships that year, but uh, people still didn't treat it really as like the best deck because um, it was kind of a rock, paper, scissors in a sense. You could play it very well against the popular Typhlosion, Typhlosion Reshiram deck, but it was not as good against the, the other Yanmega Magnezone deck. Um, but I had confidence that uh, the Reshiram Typhlosion deck was actually considered the better deck by most people. And so uh, I figured if I just countered that uh, and, and then I would just cross my fingers and hope I was mainly playing against those decks um, and then just, you know, let fate uh, decide from there. <laughs> um, so it, it did happen to work out very well. I, I definitely got very lucky in the sense that I played 
the Typhlosion deck, against the Typhlosion deck, uh, I believe five of my seven rounds in the, the Swiss portion of the tournament, and then throughout the top cut, beginning at top 32, I believe I played it every slot until that, that final top two game against uh, Ross Cawthon, um, which is probably the most intense match I've ever played in my life, uh, because Ross also had the same thought. He's a, a genius player. Um, he's a super smart guy. And so he developed a totally off the wall deck that no one had even considered like taking these cards and putting them together. He's the only person aside from a couple of his team members in the tournament playing this combo of cards uh, that they called the truth. And that's also uh, one of the ones that was sold out in stores. Um, and I feel bad for any like kid that buys that deck expecting like a fun uh, deck to play against each other because the the knowledge needed to really play that deck uh, is so intense and it's not like a fun entertaining deck to play uh, but it was a very good deck um, and so it, it he also was basically countering those other popular decks and I, I almost just got lucky in the sense that my deck might have been the only other thing in the entire tournament that could really uh, counter his deck in the sense that his was all about this perfect math that uh, the other decks couldn't hit. They could only do a certain amount of damage. And then his deck was all about moving these, these damage counters around to different guys. So nothing would ever uh, faint. Um, and I had the ability to do multiple attacks where I could just stack energy cards on the Magna zone and do a lot of damage at once, which uh, was the only way to really beat that deck because I could not allow him to spread those damage counters around. I could only uh, one shot yeah. KO stuff. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was that was totally wild. And the last crazy experience of that uh, was basically at that time, I did not uh, wear a watch. Um, I just kind of went off the the knowledge of, I think it's been, you know, somewhat close to an hour or something like that, uh, which, which came into play at the very end because a, a strategy is basically, I won the first match which meant he was allowed to choose whether or not to go first or second. Going first was a huge advantage at the time and basically decided almost the rest of the game being able to evolve sooner than your opponent. Um, and so I was kind of taking my time with the second game, knowing that I would lose. I didn't get set up in time because he was allowed to go first. Uh, and then I was going to uh, fold that game, concede, be able to choose my, my starting position of first for the third match. Uh, and then uh, while we were shuffling, I misjudged the time and the, the time limit was actually called, which meant it went into a sudden death where I did not get to choose. And instead, a coin flip oh, 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 happened. Um, oh, my goodness. So, again, just, uh, you know, sheer luck of the day, I won the coin flip, was allowed to go first, and was able to take that sudden death prize on my very next turn after, uh, after getting a very good um, starting hand. So, uh, yeah, that's my, my brief history of the day. Um, Totally, totally crazy. I'm grateful that uh, I was able to have enough luck and enough skill at that day to, you know, do what I did. Yeah, that's a great story. Um, yeah, I'm curious when you're in the middle of that match, or even when you're right before that match starts, the number one match. How nervous were you? Do you remember back? Were you just were you too young to be nervous? Were you just confident in the zone, or were you, you know, hey, this is for everything? I, you know, how did you feel? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I haven't really like dived in to relive that moment in the same way in a long time. I remember, so being a senior in 2009 when I was getting second, I remember at every step of the way, it being my first Worlds, it suddenly making it into that top 32, being able to ascend that ladder. After every match, I was just totally grateful for how far I came and expected absolutely nothing out of the next match. And it allowed me to, to kind of have this calmness. And I think come 2011, having gone through that, uh, period of, of kind of like ascending the ladder in, in the world championships and maintaining that calmness. I think I was able to, to keep that. Um, I, I think of it as like a, a, a cold, fast beating heart in the sense like it didn't make my mind super nervous. Like I know my heart was beating. I know the whole time I was like uh, it just in this calm focused state uh, while still having like a, a relatively high heart rate. Um, and just feeling kind of the, the pressure mount, but being able to block it all out. Um, and again, it was, it was just, I think I was just grateful at every level for how far I had come. And I really did not expect, it wasn't until I was on that final stage again, 
that I think everything really hit me. And I know throughout those games, I was like getting a little bit nervous, able to maintain composure, but um, yeah, still uh, just able to block out the pressure enough for those last, um, that last hour. But it's, yeah, it's a feeling unlike any other. Um, and again, even in that final match, I, I was really just, I didn't go in expecting to win and I didn't go in with any kind of like, uh, I don't want to say I didn't have hope because I had plenty of hope. I knew my deck had, had very powerful capabilities, um, but I was, yeah, again, just happy to be there um, and, and excited to see what played out on the board. Um, just enjoying the moment, uh, each, each single play down of a card, uh, hearing the crowd reaction, um, just getting to embrace that, I think, is its own, its own win. And then, yeah, managing to pull out a win on top. Uh, yeah, totally, totally unreal. Yeah, that's so great. Um, I, I think of you, and I could be completely wrong. Of course, I'm running around a room trying to pick up cards and meet people. But, but I, thought, I think of you back then as very independent for your age. Um, you know, I, I don't recall your parents being around. I don't know if that was the case or not. I just didn't see them or meet them. But so, so you know, were you as independent as I pictured you? And, and has that kind of always been a trait in you? Yeah, totally. And honestly, I, again, an amazing point to bring up because I think I attribute that to uh, Pokemon because uh, my mom was was there. Um, my dad was just watching from home when I finally told him I was in top two. He's like, oh, I guess I better pay attention. <laughs> um, but uh, I had started out playing years ago before that, a very uh, shy and kind of like uh, not independent child. And, and even only being 16, obviously, that's not uh, an, an old age. I can't claim to have grown and learned all I, I was going to learn. But uh, just in those few short years, I think uh, being under pressure in those kinds of top cut scenarios and just playing a, a whole day of, of kind of intense strategic gaming while also uh, socializing with other people, making friends, um, using that sometimes to your advantage by by networking and, and finding out what other people were playing, it all culminates in a a very intense kind of growth experience for for kids. And that's part of the reason I think Pokemon is such a great game is it, it really encourages uh, that kind of individual uh, ascension um, in just becoming better at the skill that you're practicing and then all the other uh, components that go into a successful tournament day. Like it's so much more than just coming in with the deck. It's It's again, it's about the networking. It's about uh, being friendly enough that other people are willing to give you information on other players, and then you can use that to your advantage. Um, a, a quick funny story, actually, in that tournament, uh, one of my top cup matches, um, I had played against uh, another guy, and then um, there might have been some some sour uh, feelings afterwards, mainly due to my deck being something that uh, was designed to crush his deck, basically, so it might not have been the most enjoyable experience for him. Um, and then my mom was uh, watching in the crowd watching one of my next matches and I guess uh, the guy was there talking with some friends um, talking about me you know maybe not, nothing like mean or nothing like that but you know saying some like ah, just kind of bitter things like that and uh, <laughs> and my mom spoke up she's like oh you know his mom's standing right here <laughs> and I guess they're all real embarrassed so uh, yeah she's always got my back which is which is awesome that's that's great that's great you know now you showed us real quick that the couple of checks on the wall um, you know, I was curious about your trophies, the physical trophies. Do you still yeah. have them, the, the, the Pikachus or whatever? Oh, yeah. Let me actually walk this real quick all the way downstairs. Uh, so are, you, we're, I, we're, are we going, uh, David, we're going <laughs> to the trophy gallery now? Where are we going? Absolutely. So okay. I actually keep them in my living room just so that uh, when all guests come over, they, they see it. Uh, so, again, here are the two trophies the the first place and the second place wow um, and uh what i love about these is i think they're a lot more uh kind of classy looking than the pikachu holding the the trophy so i know that's kind of the modern style they use but i'm a huge fan of these old glass ones because on first look you almost don't realize it's a it's a pokemon trophy it just looks like a very uh cool important first place thing um, yeah. and then seeing the that it's a pokeball and stuff i think that's just a whole new level of uh, awesomeness. Yeah, that's great. The, um, I, I know that the new trophies as well, as I'm sure you're aware, they don't hold up all that well. So there's been, yeah. there's been a tremendous amount of breakage and things that have happened over time. So I think having a good old fashioned glass one's probably a, probably a safer long-term bet for sure. 
Yeah, uh, that too. I've transported these many times. And yeah, I think I just finally got rid of their original boxes because they're getting real beat up. And I was like, if I'm only moving these probably, you know, once every few years, I can just hold them carefully and move them. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, I love the old trophies. I really wish they'd bring them back because I know how much money is now kind of flowing into the organized play scene and how big it's growing, which I think is amazing. Um, but I, I do wish they would bring a different style of trophy. So maybe if, if enough of the Pikachus break, maybe they'll realize they got to shift the design. Yeah, yeah. So you, you, um, you got the, uh, the, the, the monies for your winning. What did, have you used it? Did you use it? Did it propel you to school and other things like that? Yeah, so uh, the, the trophy cards... Um, that I that I sold went kind of directly to really cool experiences, which was awesome. So like when I after I uh, after this one, I believe that money went after winning worlds. That money went straight towards a uh, high school uh, class trip to Britain um, with some buddies, um, and even wow. some of that probably flowed towards the next year going to Germany in the same kind of class trip. And so I, I really wouldn't have had the capital for those kinds of experiences without uh, uh, having you know won worlds and sold these cards and stuff and then the the scholarship money itself um yeah went towards uh i think i'd gone to a private high school so it went mostly towards that um but that just allowed uh kind of more funds to be allocated later for for college which is always a good thing i know now they just kind of give out uh straight cash which i think is probably overall better because i know a lot of winners uh aren't they might be done with their school experience, especially master's division and some older players. Um, and so I think, yeah, just having just straight money to be able to use towards whatever thing they prefer is probably the better option. So I'm glad they've migrated towards that versus uh, giving out strict scholarship um, awards like they used to. Now you, you had a, a deck made for your, your deck as well, right? That was put on the market, publicly sold. Um, I know there was one for the 2011 number one, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Was there one, i just curious, was there one made for the 2009 number two? Yes, there was. I actually got both of them uh, in my nightstand and then I keep some extra ones in case I ever want to give them out to ladies to impress them. Uh, oh, but, I like that. Um, <laughs> the, Fantastic. Yeah, the, uh, this is the one I won with. Um, with, the, with that inside. And then this is the 2009 one. Um, which I think was actually a cooler box design. Uh, but yeah, they, they sold this deck as well, um, which again is, is kind of uh, a little bit embarrassing, a little bit, feel a little bit guilty that uh, my name is kind of on this deck that we basically stole the night before. Um, but I think I've, I've since been, been given blessing by its original creators for the most part. So uh, uh, they're just happy that you know, their creation is out there. <laughs> And what do they what do they give you when you when you get your deck made? Do they give you a handful of them, or do they just give you one, or is it just the privilege of having it out there in the market? Because I don't know if anybody really knows. I don't know that after all these years, when when somebody makes a deck for a player. Yeah, they basically just give you a, a bunch of them, not a ton. Like I think they give you uh, one of every every one. So they print four decks total. They give you one of each, and then they give you an extra somewhere between six and like eight of your own. Um, so not not like a massive uh, jug or nothing, um, but you know enough. I still have some, even these many years later, because I I don't give them out totally freely. I, I wait until you know it's someone important enough in my life that I'm I'm handing it out. Yeah, that's not a good. I I, I love the story up till then, David. But then you're telling me you're giving out to ladies and you still got all six <laughs> left. So I think maybe we could work on that a little bit. You know. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, they they really got to earn it. Um, now maybe you should lower your standards just a bit or buy more decks. I don't know. We got to figure it out. We'll just try to come up with something to help out if we can. So that's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. We'll put the, we'll put the market call out there. I got more decks to give away. So perfect. Um, tell me about your life since then. So, you know, what, what, how about schooling and, and what are you doing today? I think people would love to hear kind of catch up. Yeah. So uh, that was my junior year of high school when I won. So I graduated two years later, um, went to, a college, it's, it's called Western Washington University. So I'm from Seattle, Washington, and this is basically a, a s smaller public college uh, up right on the, the Canadian border. Um, so just far enough away from home that I could live up there, but I, I could come home if I needed to, but I didn't have uh, you know, family breathing down my neck or, or 
felt responsible to live at home or anything like that because I really wanted to move out. Um, so I went to school, a uh, four-year degree in uh, management information systems, um, which is a business administration degree, and uh, with the intention of going into either IT or, or data analytics or something to that sense. So as of right now, I am a, a senior data scientist at a company called Geocaching, um, which uh, I'm hoping a lot of people watching this video might know of because it's very similar to Pokemon Go. Uh, it's, it's an online um, location-based uh, game. The main difference is people actually hide physical objects at uh, locations. Um, whereas like Pokemon Go, you go find a, a Pokemon, you know, and you catch it. Um, this is like someone's hidden a, a Tupperware there or something. Uh, and then you get to sign your name in and it's just kind of a fun outdoor activity, especially during like uh, COVID times. Um, it gets you to go out to some cool places that, that might not be as populated as some of like the hiking trails and things like that so yeah life is good I'm living in Seattle um, which I know still has a very powerful uh, kind of Pokemon player base um, a lot of my friends still play so I every year I tell myself like oh maybe I'll get back in this year um, and then you know it doesn't quite happen but every year I, I leave the option open um, because I think uh, the game really doesn't require as much manpower and hours putting, putting in towards it as maybe some other things do. Uh, but it does require a lot of kind of intense thinking about it because you want to go into a tournament and a scenario with pretty much the knowledge of anything that could happen. You want to know every single card you might see. You want to know uh, all the different card combos that people might have in their decks. Um, all the different variations within a single deck. So you see one card, your mind immediately starts jumping to like what all you might see within the next few turns. Um, so, I, I mean, I don't want to scare anyone away, but uh, it's because it's still a very easy, fun game, especially at the to start in and you kind of ramp up. Um, great community. Uh, yeah, cannot recommend it enough. Um, but yeah, life is life is great. I'm working from home during all of the, the quarantine times. So this is my office as well as my uh, bedroom and hangout spot. That's uh, congratulations. That's a great, uh, great progress. And, and congratulations on what sounds like a great job and, and all of that too. So someone Thank with you. your, uh, with your intellectual capabilities, it's not surprising that you're going to be quite successful moving along. You <laughs> just have to translate that over to the dating scene now. So yeah. Um, so, you know, you talk about that you still maybe have some contacts in the community and some, you know, exposure to the game. Do you have a feeling for the difference in the game, uh, playing the game today versus when you played? I've heard, again, I'm not a game player. Uh, well, I mean, let's not ask my wife that. I shouldn't say I'm not a player of the game. Um, but I've heard that there's more luck involved today than maybe there was back then. So I don't know if that's true or not. Um, but sometimes people will criticize and say it's less skill-based at a certain point in time. What, um, what can you tell me from your much more professional experience uh, type of, you know, view? Yeah, I think uh, it all kind of ties back to the, the power creep that I think maybe the game is still struggling with. And I don't know exactly where it's at as of today, but I, I still believe it's, it's at the time that I was uh, playing a lot, you had just kind of started seeing a lot less emphasis on kind of evolving your Pokemon and having these strategies that took a few turns to build up. Um, and now I think it's it's difficult some in a lot of formats in the recent years to to have a deck that is a bit slower and then kind of can get ramped up which i think is where the game really shines i think those decks are are fun and when you have all of them uh facing against each other it's a very nice healthy format um and i think a lot of the emphasis on these very powerful uh basic super ex cards and things like that it can definitely uh in a game that because the video game is all about evolving right so it, i feel like it kind of loses its sense of identity in that sense and brings it closer to something like Yu-Gi-Oh or magic uh which are very short uh it, like the first few turns are very important in those games and they're very short in comparison to pokemon which i think by nature should be a longer more drawn out uh strategic battle um in terms of of more luck i i believe that also again just ties into like the, the power creep like if all these cards are super powerful at a certain point it, it is more about luck and having these kind of really powerful first couple turns um i think the biggest difference just from what i've seen is actually just in the quality of of player that's much higher today 
than it, it was back when I played. So if I could go into a tournament kind of knowing that I might be the best player there or close to, and if I, if I wasn't playing a kind of name that I recognized uh, in the community, it was likely they were still kind of at that beginner level. They might not have that great of a deck or just have the knowledge to be uh, much of an adversary. But nowadays, there's so much great information out online um, that uh, I think people can ramp themselves up and get into a tournament vastly more prepared than they used to be, which then results in in uh, the, the kind of stigma of like, okay, now it's more luck-based because everyone's good. But I think it, it could be the opposite. It's just, it's because everyone's good, you have to be that much incrementally better, which I think yeah. actually is, is awesome. Um, and then it just has to be balanced again with the card pool and, and having decks that promote strategy and being fun rather than uh, just being lucky and, and getting a good start, basically. You know, my, my thing and the reason anybody watches any of this, it's certainly not to look at me. We know that for sure. Um, but the reason they're supposed to watch me is because I'm, you know, collecting the English cards. So just curious, you know, as a player, certainly from my experience, very few players collect. If anything, they're, they're buying the cards and having to focus on getting four of this or that or whatever they need to put in the deck. So did you ever collect? Do you collect? Do you have cards that still, you know, are in your possession that mean something to you from back then? Anything like that around collecting? Yeah, I, I have a very... Uh uncollective personality in that sense like I really I cared all about just having uh, the deck towards the the peak of my career I actually barely owned any cards and I was almost always borrowing cards I believe I only actually owned uh, one Embor and one Magnazone from my my deck when I won world so I, I gave back the majority of the deck to other people um, so the the cards that have really sentimental value to me are basically those those one of cards that may have been in my two worlds decks that uh, when I got second and then when I won so it's pretty much just a single sheet of, of single cards that I owned um, and other than that yeah I just I was never that into collecting the cards um, just uh yeah, i just love the game itself love playing it and couldn't be bothered to <laughs> to go pick up the cards and that's kind of where having all those contacts and being uh social making friends also comes into play because then people are very willing to to help you out you know other people will run around a whole tournament morning of to help find you uh cards to borrow from people um which again to speak to the community is amazing because in a game like Yu-Gi-Oh, i've heard you, you would never loan people cards because there's a lot of thieving and things like that in that uh in that space so i think pokemon is an amazing uh community as well as just a fun game um so i think that probably is is one of the explanations for why you were not you know uh hesitant to necessarily sell me your card because <laughs> the card itself wasn't so um so meaningful as the championship and the win that's very true yeah so the i mean the trophy means a lot to me uh the and just the experience itself but yeah the the cards itself i don't have as much of a uh, just personal attachment to um yeah <laughs> you, know, you talk about the community and after all these years do you still keep in contact with some of the guys that you were involved with some of the guys and girls or you know has it faded uh, i mean it sure sounds like from just our discussion today that you you really have fond memories of it and i'm so glad to hear that because you know, what I don't want to see is someone like you who's the wonderful child star, right? And then it's all downhill from there. Right. And on, you know, <laughs> some, some kind of bad path as we sometimes see with celebrities. So. Yeah, I'm selling my, uh, selling my decks to, you know, yeah, buy meth on the street. Yeah, yeah exactly. That, yeah. So we, so. Don't, we don't want to see that. So, so um, do you still yeah. keep contact with the, the folks? Absolutely. I, yeah, like with COVID and everything, you know, falling off contact even less. Uh, with people just outside of my straight inner circle and roommates and stuff, which is unfortunate. But um, yeah, every year I try to, at, if not make it to a tournament or two, like a large regional tournament, uh, at least in some way, hang out with people. Uh, I have a couple group chats, so I'm still uh, talking a lot with with members of the community and good friends I made through that. So, I mean, it's, it's transcended far beyond uh, like, I think of them as Pokemon friends in the sense I met them at Pokemon, but it's not just people that are relegated to this quadrant of my life. It's it's they're they're real great friends that uh, I cherish and you know communicate with and hang out with. Uh, regrettably, not enough, but hopefully uh, after COVID, I think everyone will have uh, kind of realized what what they're missing with a lot of 
extra social interaction and maybe there'll be a, a spurt of um, people just spending time with each other and cherishing that, uh, you know, time to be close to, to someone else that you've, that you've met and shared these kinds of cool experiences with. Yeah, it's um, definitely a different time, a time we would have never expected in our lifetimes. And yeah, I don't know if it's, I don't know what the difference is, someone your age versus someone my age as well, only because I've, you know, lived longer and, and over a span of a much longer lifetime, never seen anything like this. So maybe we're getting all you, you younger folks to um, get all the bad stuff out of the way early and often. So the rest of your life is just a primrose path going forward. I don't know. That's true. I mean, yeah, compare anything to, to yeah, this year, you know, maybe, yeah, everything will just kind of pale in comparison. And it's, uh, it's obviously always good to have uh, frames of reference and be able to appreciate then what you have during normal times. Um, so maybe we'll see, uh, again, people just cherish these little things a little more, but then again, people forget things very quickly once they're outside of a, uh, you know, uh, a traumatic time or anything like that. So we'll see what happens, but yeah. That's a behavioral uh, finance concept called the recency effect. So yeah, exactly. It actually is that, yeah, that they always, they use the analogy that women wouldn't have more babies if they remembered the pain they had to go through at the time, but luckily enough time passes where, right. um, where they don't have to worry about that. So yeah, it's, we do have short memories. And of course with social media, much more, so, um, you know, slight attention spans these days. Yeah, that's true. On the bright side, the social media means we can at least stay connected in some sense a lot more than we would have been if, if this kind of thing happened 20 years ago. So I right. think that part's super cool, but definitely even for myself during uh, non quarantine times, I think, social media has its ups and downs because it allows me to connect to these people which means i feel like i don't i don't feel that responsibility to to then go out and spend in person time um nearly as much as i probably should so it's yeah it's always a balance for sure well social media did us proud today because it got me on a, a wonderful call with you which is what uh which is what i had been thinking about for a long time you know it's such a, a neat format that i have right now to be able to to reintroduce people to folks like you who I've been so impressed with, like I said, I, you know, from the minute of, of going to those championships and watching you as a very young person, um, being able to achieve such tremendous results and, and do it in such an independent, confident fashion, um, you definitely, you know, had an identity and a charisma and a, you know, a kind of a, a reputation that people just said, you know, there's David Cohen. It's like the name was there. So. So um, I'm, I'm proud uh, to, you know, to own your, your 2011 number one. Um, it's something that I cherish and I'm, I'm proud to be able to have uh, got you on a call today uh, to chat with, with all of my viewers because I hope they'll, they'll take the time to look up your history a little bit, um, like you said, and, and understand some of the historical perspective because you are well worth um, researching and understanding the, the incredible influence you've had on the game and, and on people that have been around you. So I just, I can't say, you know, enough. Thank you so much for, for taking the time to be on with me today. And um, I, I'm just very blessed that, uh, that you would do that. Yeah, thank you again, y'all. All, all that absolutely flattering means so much to me. I'm, I'm grateful to be on this platform and just have some form of opportunity to, to broadcast anything about Pokemon that I can to, to people, um, just given that, especially, that I have not been broadcasting it for the last few years uh, nearly as much as I feel like I should have. So happy to have the opportunity. All right, David. Thank you so much, man. You take care. Great to see you. Thank you. You too. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.